The most important thing for us is to document where science stood. We wanted to make a film that in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years, would be just as relevant as it is today because it would show science grappling with observations that called its own fundamental basic assumptions into question. Once we had finished, or pretty much finished the film, we were in final editing, we decided to uh, put up a website, cut a trailer, and you know, just start doing what every independent filmmaker does. You know, you try to get some people interested and uh, hopefully build a little bit of buzz. We had uh, a lot of controversy, but we were still very much uh, an indie science doc and, and nothing much more. And then, in April of 2014, overnight, the principle became the third highest trending story on the World Wide Web. Literally millions upon millions upon millions of people all of a sudden, overnight, heard about this film. And the story that they heard was remarkable. Crazed geocentrists trick the leading scientists in the world into appearing in a film that makes them look like they believe in geocentrism. This is the power of the media today. If everybody says it, it must be true. And so when the story broke, the headlines, the remarkable claims, Lawrence Krauss said he had never appeared in the film, that we had rented or, or you know, bought footage or used used footage off of YouTube. Uh, uh, Kate Mulgrew said, you know, if I would have only known what it was about, I never would have even uh, had anything to do with it. And I'm going, wow. So my partner and I decided that what we had to do was find a platform that would allow us to get our side of the story out, even if it would only reach a tiny percentage. And we found that platform in Michael Boris and Church Militant TV. Here was our chance to finally put the facts on the table. We had the signed release forms. We had the signed contracts from Max and John Hartnett for scientific consultation. We had the outtakes. We had the footage that we hadn't cut into the film. And as the controversy was reaching its peak, Michael very graciously agreed to have Bob and I come onto the show and tell our side of the story. The, the movie comes out, people are being, people in the film, the, the scientists you're interviewing are getting these, these pieces of information through various sources, we'll get to that later, uh, and being told, hey, they misquoted you, hey, they duped you, hey, this is wrong, hey, God. even, and many people watching may not know most of these names, but they'll all certainly know Kate Mulgrew, and she's, you know, Captain Janeway mm -hmm. from the Star Trek series, uh, yeah. it was popular, you know, 15, 15 years or so ago, you recognize her voice immediately, uh, she posts something on Facebook, oh my gosh, I was duped, had she seen the film at that point? None of them have, Mike. All of these guys, all not of these scientists. The most reviewed film in history <laughs> by people who've never bothered to watch it first. All right. In one 24-hour period, we went whoosh and became, I think at one point, the third largest trending story on the World Wide Web. There were 150 news outlets that carried this story. And 100 it, in 24-hour period. In yeah. a 24-hour period. And it was always the same story. Duped into film by evil geocentrist Holocaust deniers. Really? Okay, so... Well, they, they did see the trailer, and I think all these conclusions are being made. Yeah, that's the true. They're basing it off the trailer. And the trailer, of course, is a trailer. It's designed to stir up controversy. Well, of course it is. Sure and, uh, sure you know, is. we just assumed that we'd get the same treatment as everybody else, which is a foolish assumption. Yeah. We've clearly touched a nerve. We're clearly questioning something that some very far powerful people are uncomfortable having questioned. Well, that's absolutely the case. But, and hey, where, listen... And where those people are, we will get into them. Look, here's the bottom line. I believe that it's a sign of good documentary filmmaking when the status quo is up in arms at the mere fact of having asked some questions. That is a big question. This is what it all comes down to, right? Mm -hmm. 
Did they get checks for their work? They sure did. Did they cash the checks? They did. <laughs> Show me the money. <laughs> All right. They were not duped when it came to cashing no, the check. No, they didn't yeah. get duped on cashing the checks. Now, here's the thing. Max, for example, said, was quoted as saying in Popular Science magazine, that we claim to be an independent film team. Well, we are guilty of that. And that we claimed to be making a normal cosmology doc. Well, I don't think we ever claimed to be making a normal cosmology doc. Anybody who's seen it will know right away it's not. Right. It's an extraordinary cosmology doc. The question is, did Max know that we were going to talk about things like the Earth in the center of the universe? Or was he somehow tricked? This next clip, I think, is going to definitively address whether we made a normal cosmology doc and whether Max had any idea that we were talking about things like the Earth being in the center and of the Earth. This is a side chat with you and... Yeah, this is from his first interview. Uh, I was interviewing him, and if you just give a listen, I think it'll uh, make it quite clear that we were very upfront about what we were talking Let's about. Let's roll the clip. Let me read a quote, another quote from Professor Krauss. Yeah. And, and just get... And, and then we can move on from this particular aspect, because the centrality of Earth in the cosmic microwave background is a fascinating... Yeah, it could be a mistake, it could be a glitch, but... There are other elements that mm -hmm. are pointing in the same direction. Now, Krauss says, Professor Krauss says, when you look at the CMB map, you see that the structure that is observed is in fact, in fact, in a weird way, correlated with the plane of the Earth around the sun. Is this Copernicus coming back to haunt us? That's crazy. We're looking out at the whole universe. There's no way there should be a correlation of structure with our motion of the Earth around the sun, the plane of the uh, Earth around the sun, the ecliptic. That would say we are truly the center of the universe. Would you agree with that assessment? <laughs> I don't think that this is telling us that Earth is in any way the center of the universe. If it turns out that these strange patterns are in some way lined up with our solar system, I think it's more likely that uh, my esteemed colleagues who did this experiment somehow have some additional little systematic problem with, with their measurements that gets contaminated by something to do with the solar system. Okay, now that's, Lawrence started this whole thing. Yeah. When he gave a fascinating interview to NPR where he basically said, I don't remember doing this interview. If I did it, they probably just grabbed footage of me off the internet. And if they didn't, then they must have bought it from another production company. And if they didn't, well, then I probably signed a release form that I don't remember. I just don't know. What that, that sounds like his answer to how did the universe come <laughs> to be. <laughs> Here's 400 explanations that don't make sense, and in the end, I just don't know. I just don't know. Yeah. So why did NPR consider this to be a national news story? Well, I don't know. But what I can do tonight is I can make it so that Lawrence knows. Uh, we went to ASU. We had him sign a release form, which we'll show you in a second. Arizona State University, that's where he is. And, you know, our crew asked him to tell us who he was, and uh, if you roll the clip, you'll see him saying no, Well, let's roll the clip. Can you just tell me what your name and your background and what you're doing here? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually being filmed right now, but uh, my name is Lawrence Krauss, and I'm a uh, theoretical physicist and cosmologist, not to be confused with cosmetologist. And... Uh, my background is I, I have a PhD in physics and, um, and after, from MIT, and then after that I was at Harvard for a while and then at Yale for what seemed like an eternity, and then had a long respite in Cleveland, then moved here to direct uh, the Origins Project at Arizona State University, which examines everything from the origin of the universe to the origin of co consciousness, so I'm very excited about that. I'm also foundation professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University and professor of physics. That's a mouthful. Well, it certainly is a mouthful, and I've got to say right now, <laughs> Lawrence Krauss signed a release form. Here it is. Yeah, There's let's, been let's roll the release form. 1,500 news articles saying that it doesn't exist. Yes, it exists. And let's show it. it real quick. Yes, it does tell him that we're going to be seeking out controversial... It's the same release. Everybody got the same it's the release. Sa everybody right? got yeah, the same Yeah, your lawyers release. made it up. There's no and multiple releases. It's very clear, cut, and dry. So we actually asked Michio, should we be making a film about the Copernican Principle, and I think his answer is fascinating. Let's roll the tape and hear what he says. Could you just tell us who you are and your academic affiliation, anything you'd like the audience to know about you? My name is Dr. Michio Kaku. That's M-I-C-H-I-O-K-A-K-U. I'm a professor of theoretical physics here at the City University of New York, 
My latest book, Physics of the Future, is a New York Times bestseller. A layman should never question the Copernican principle. They should never question where money is being spent. They should n never ask questions of somebody of, 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 of a higher education on being able to do a documentary at, at this caliber when talking to people like you. What do you say about that? Well, personally, I think we should always question everything. Uh, first of all, why do we have this crash of 2008? It's because precisely people did not ask simple questions. Simple questions such as, why are property values keep on rising? Won't it ever peak and fall? Nobody asked that question. It's such a simple question, and yet trillions of dollars of value simply vanish because no one asked a simple question. So sometimes the simplest question Sometimes the simplest questions are the hardest questions because they go to the root of the problem. And sometimes when we don't answer these simple questions, we get into a lot of trouble. All right, mm -hmm. that, that does not sound like to me somebody who's saying, don't question. Yeah. <laughs> now, Mike, yeah. Quote, you... we should always question everything, close quote. For Kate, it was real simple. She claimed that she was misinformed and that she agreed with Lawrence Krauss that he had been misinformed. I don't quite understand how by quoting Lawrence Krauss, we could be misinforming him. I don't understand how if Kate read this script for three weeks, which she did, and her management firm due diligence did for three weeks before that, which they did, this is a New York management firm, what is the possible basis for saying that they were misinformed? but they didn't know. Kate did such a marvelous job on this film. When you watch the film, you're gonna see that her incredible narration in this film carries it. She takes us by the hand and, and leads us through this exploration of these incredibly advanced and powerful concepts and always seems to ground us. Truth is, her management firm didn't want her going on camera and we said, okay, that's fine, we don't need her on camera. We're, she's, we just want her for her. She and I got to talking about this, and afterwards she said, is that cameraman still here? Because we were filming the New York footage. She's, I said, yeah. She says, well, I'd like to say a few things. And she went on camera, and she praised the script to the skies. First of all, the material to me is fascinating. Secondly, I'm not uh, on camera. So there's something very private, relaxed, and c deeply creative about it. The first time around, I mean, a lot of this stuff is difficult. I have to uh, organize it in my mind. I have to fully understand it. I have to separate it out. Do you know, it has to make perfect sense to me. And something clicked for Kate, because when she walked back out here, I walked in and I said, okay, Kate, we've got a great clean reading. Let's just swing for the fences. So that the second time around, I can endow it with all the emotion it deserves. In the book of Genesis, God tells Abraham, look up and number the stars if you can. This is the beginning of faith and the beginning of science. Now this next cue, I want you to understand this is what Kate Mulgrew read. Yes. Into the microphone, but also pay attention because now this brings us back to Max. Remember back in 2011, Max said, ah, I don't think these alignments are, there's probably a mistake there. There couldn't be any connection between our solar system and the cosmic microwave background. Well, this is now post Planck. Right. We went back. Late, later data, folks. 2013, two years later. I've spent I've spent two years emailing Max back and forth about this stuff. We've talked <clears> about <throat> this. And now listen to what first of all Kate asks him, or Kate reads from the script, and then listen to what Max says about these weird alignments with our local neighborhood. Roll All right, let's clip. roll this clip. But what about the alignments with the ecliptic and equinoxes, which Lawrence Krauss had said would mean we were really the center of the universe? We asked Max Tegmark if Planck's results had convinced him that the axis of evil actually was aligned with our ecliptic and equinoxes. I have, to conf I, I have to confess that I was bothered by the fact that the axis of evil seemed l linked to a special direction in our solar system. And something in my gut was telling me that this might, even though I greatly trust the people on the WMAP team, point to something fishy in, in their analysis. 
But I also feel very strongly that I have to actually override my gut by using my brain and by looking at data. And now we have completely independent data with better detectors, completely different people seeing the same thing. So there's just no way we can blame this on the WMAP team. Well, after the Vora show aired, everything began to change. What we noticed is that more and more people in the comm boxes started noticing that, you know, it really doesn't make sense. Kate Mulgrew would sit there and read the script for a month. Her New York management firm would do a due diligence on the company, its principals, everybody who was involved. With, they were all listed on our IMDb page. Nobody was hiding anything. I checked the film thousands and thousands and thousands of time, and there's just nothing about the Jews in the film. It just isn't. It's a film about cosmology. It's a film about the Copernican principle. But the tide had turned. People were beginning to recognize that this story, this Captain Janeway and the Seven Cosmologist fairy tale, just didn't hold up to even the most basic logical scrutiny. And consequently, we were able to bring the project to completion and to secure that wonderful opportunity that so few independent films get to actually be able to show the film in theaters. And uh, that is precisely uh, what we ended up doing in October of 2014 when we opened the film in Chicago. I'm hoping that sanity can be restored here. Mm -hmm. Everybody got scared. Everybody said, oh, I've been doing... You know, let's be adults here. Mm -hmm. We've made a film. Let's let the film stand on its merits. Let's stop reviewing the film if we haven't seen the film. And let's stop being so terrified of the possibility that the Earth might be in a special place in the cosmos. At the end of the day, 400 years ago, Bruno, Giordano Bruno, was burned on the streets of Rome for daring to question the place of Earth in the cosmos. Now, thank God I haven't been burned at the stake. But is it possible that we still have questions that we're not allowed to ask? Have we come full circle to the point where we're not even allowed to ask the question anymore? Could Earth be the center of the universe? What would it mean for our view of ourselves, our culture, our destiny? What would it mean if it were to turn out that we really are special. If we've reached a point where that question cannot even be asked anymore, then we have a bigger problem than I ever would have imagined. It is my sincere hope that no matter what your personal views on this may be, that you will insist on the right of filmmakers and other artists and investigators to ask even the most controversial, even the most uncomfortable questions, and to make sure that that right is always upheld and protected, especially when the questions really get to the very foundation of what it means to be human.